I love being measured. So you know. <laughs> <laughs> right, well, welcome to our little soiree here. That's like spotlight. You obviously got easily folded. <laughs> Ryan John. Okay. Well, hello. Oh, yes, yeah, I do apologise for swearing. Although it may happen again. Is all I'll say. <laughs> John, welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Um, I've been sat with John all morning. We've been chatting away. So we've plenty to chat about. We're going to the next forty minutes or so. We're going to talk a little bit about John's uh, life, particularly we're going to chat on his new book, Run to the Shadows, Walk the Sun. Well, uh, first of all, uh, I never dreamt I'd ever write a book. Uh, so I love Shakespeare. I get this book as soon as they come out. Um, it's a Shakespeare joke, really. <laughs> and I'd never written a book before, and it turns out because I had very little education, and I did some of my own when I was about 25, and I was also dyslexic, which wasn't recognized back in the 50s when I was in school. And um, so the fact that I actually wrote a book, having denied wanting to write one, I am so glad I did. I had words of mine, but the ghostwriter puts them in a better perspective and a better situation. And his name is Michael Seeley, and his talent is just absolutely brilliant. Without him, I could not have done it, and that's the truth. Um, I lived in Los Angeles. Um, Katie Manning told me not to say Hollywood, because that sounds like showing off. But the whole of Los Angeles is Hollywood, whether you like it or not. But I was there for 21 years. I fell in love with a woman named Jennifer, and um, I'd never been in love before, so it was a very wonderful thing. And we were together 20 years, and that whole time we lived in in Burbank, in California, and she was an executive secretary to the vice president of Warner Brothers Studio, which was a very lucky job to get. And so therefore, I had a lot of time at Warner Brothers Studio every day I'd drive her to work. And because I was a little bit famous myself, I met all the big stars because Warner Brothers, as you know, made, they make movies with all the biggest names in the history of Hollywood. So long story short, um, I became a long distance runner uh, back in about 1987, uh, out of boredom and desperation. And I think I did I was walking I lived in a small village outside of London called Sunbury on Thames. And one day I was just walking down the road and I run my past. I mean I was thinking, God, what? It made like a noise like God, what it must have been like to run. So the next day I went to the most expensive shoe shop, bought the most expensive I didn't have any money, but I bought the most expensive running pair of shoes. Became a long distance runner. Now when I got to America, uh, Hollywood isn't what you think it is. It's bloody hard and very, very difficult. And to survive there, you've got to have a lot of work and a lot of everything. And you know, 80% of people fail in Hollywood because it's a brutal um, situation to live in. So my wife and I, uh, as much in love as we were, she, we both started to write, but we had mountains. We lived just below the mountains. Only a rented accommodation. The cheapest house in Hollywood is $600,000. And I came nowhere near her. So long story short, we used to climb the mountain every weekend. Uh, and I began writing then, so we'd take three hours to climb the mountain, and then we'd sit on the top of it, and walk the mountain, and I'd spend two hours uh, eating our sandwiches and drinking our orange juice, because I don't drink alcohol. And um, then we used to walk down, and it used to take three hours to walk down the mountain, we used to have to go round the mountain, round the fire trail. And one day we left it too late, and as you know, California is a desert, so therefore it's 120 degrees of the sun, but it's freezing cold in the shade. And because you don't wear any clothes in California, just the smallest socks, the smallest t-shirts, because it is so hot. We were coming down the mountain one day, and I had a touch of malaria. And, was like, was like, was like, and you get, anyone here have malaria? Most of you not. But you get the malaria shakes every couple of years after. And you end up a, a bit of like Parkinson's. Well, I had one of the shakes. And I passed out in the, in the shadow, and it was so cold, my wife thought I was going to die of being cold. So the next week we were up there, I remember thinking now, as you go down the north of the mountain, the sun's out, the other side is, is cold. So I, I said to Jenny, one day, Jenny, we ought to run the shadows to walk the sun. <coughs> and then, as you know, five hundred years later, I thought, what a great name. Yeah, for that, for that, for that. You've written a book, I know. Uh, well, I, 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 if I may be honest, um, I think there's a couple of people here. There's a gentleman named Shelton who's been a for a long time. I'm a bit of a old boy, so far as I have no self esteem. Certainly no guts and very little courage. I had a father that hated me and beat me. But that's what happened during the war of 1941. And not only are you always hungry, you're always beaten in school, they used to whack you with a cane until you had. It was all punishment. That's what the whole of England was. Rich punishing the poor. That's how I look at it because I'm a working class. And um, what was the question? <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I suddenly thought, you know what? 
I've had a bad opinion of myself most of my life. My self-esteem has always been down beyond my boots. And I thought, you know what? I watched a couple of my own, own shows the other day, The Demons and The Green Death. And I thought, you know what? I was pretty bloody good after all. <laughs> all the bullshit of thinking I was rubbish. And I wasn't bad. So all you young children, when you're called stupid, and you will be, just turn around to those people that are calling you stupid. You call them stupid for calling you stupid. If stupid, you're not. Well, that's what happened to me. Your brain dies because you're called stupid. And people want to hurt you. People want to bring you down. My, my word is yours. All power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. And like most of you, I've been around the world, paid for. I've seen some bad stuff. When I joined the ships, I saw the third world. I saw war, I saw all the results of it, and it's mean, and it's cruel, and it's deadly. And I do believe we're heading towards the Third World War, but we'll leave that alone for now. We won't go there, John. We won't go into the war. <laughs> we'll let it happen on its own accord. And we won't mention Brexit either. No. But you asked the question at the front of your book, actually, you say, is, is my life story worth telling? And having read the book, um, it's fair to say it's a roller coaster ride of emotion, yeah. of heartbreak, laughter. Yeah. You've got everything in that book. Yeah. Where did you, I mean, how did you start? I mean, where did you, how did you start? Because you've had such a rich life. Well, you start by crying. You start by crying your eyes out, knowing that you're going to have to face all the things that you thought hurt you in the past. Remember, my education was lousy. You will read in the book that I had a blood disease, which was two and a half years out of my life. And I was locked in a bedroom in a tiny little house. And where all my fears came from is because I couldn't play with the other children. And when all of your young friends, when, they, when you're five and six or eight, nine years old, because I was locked in this room because the blood disease was quite prevalent, or I, I can't think of the word, but other people could catch it. Um, it. What happened is I became distraught. Every time I heard the children, I couldn't hear because the windows were locked, but every time I saw the kids walk away, I thought they were walking away from me. Every time they laughed, I thought they were laughing at me. And because my dad hated me, I had nowhere to turn. So these days, you can actually go on Google and say, why doesn't anybody love me? And someone somewhere locked in a dirty little room will tell you. You know, these people that are passing all this bad stuff out, you know. I put on a website, you know, we have the Russians poisoned in my town. Right where I am, the very wet kickers the this year. They always, the laces always loosen. And the bench that the two Russians were found on is the bench I used to tighten my shoes on every week because I walked down. I put a blog up about these Russians and I had five death threats within an hour because I thought I, I, I don't think I'm on any side of it. And so all I'm saying is, no matter what you say these days, there's someone recording you or filming you always comes back and bites you. So it's very difficult these days doing these interviews, especially someone like me. Who it it's so easy to want to tell the answer to the truth, but you start doing that and you're finished. And you didn't take conscious decisions not to scandalize the Jason, everyone in this audience knows who the good actors are, they know who the bastards are, the ones that don't care, the ones that don't give a shit, and the ones that do give a shit. There are quite a few of us good ones. The reason I didn't dish dirt is because the dirt is quite dirty, and I think you would look badly on me if I spent a couple of chapters telling you how bad someone that you already know is bad, is bad. So I decided not to dish any dirt. It's just not worth it. We've all got our ups and downs. We've all been good, and you know, we've all got our little secrets. Well, I don't have many secrets, I must confess, but I decided not to. And you all know, working with Tom Baker was just the most miserable, miserable experience of my whole life. And, leave it at that, you know, I wasn't alone, there were dozens of us, so, you know, Tom knows what he did, and, and, and you have to live with what you do, you know, you are you are what you make yourself, so. How did you find working with ghostwriters? Obviously, the ghostwriters is the, the sort of, probably the word down for you, I suppose, technically, but they're all your thoughts. What was the process like for you? Well, I, it, it was, um, I, I almost hate to say this, because, you know, when, when actors say how hard a certain job was or whatever, it was traumatic insofar as you have to relive everything, and Michael Seeley will tell you, I mean, I don't mind admitting now, I'm coming up 77 years old and I've lost the woman I love. My mum's dead, my two best friends died last month. And I'm sad. I'm, I'm sad by the day. I get up every morning thinking, what the hell am I going to do today? Now, having said that, let me just tell you one thing. I don't know whether there is a God and I don't know whether he had a son called Jesus. But there has to be something else out there than the bullshit that we're living in. Remember, I've, been, I've walked this earth for 77 years and like anybody that's my age here, you see a lot of stuff in those days. And all I know is that there are good people and there are bad people. And you, the, the footprint you leave behind. I am now thrilled with the footprint I'm leaving behind. I know I'm a good man. And there's a couple of other people here that know I am too. Now, I am a little bit, um, you know, I can't speak offensively sometimes. But that's usually because I'm trying to get at the people that are hurting people. 
Injustice is my big thing. I nearly got stabbed on a train about four months ago. This little piece of garbage had his feet on the train and pushed an old lady. And I wanted to take his throat out, and guess what? I could have. And I went up to him and I said, I suggest you go up to that lady and apologize. And he pulled a knife out and he said the F word. He said, why don't you effing make me? And I thought, do you know what? To see a headline in the newspapers, John Levine, would-be actor, stabbed to death on Southwest train 502, trying to save an old lady. And I suddenly realized that this knife business is actually quite real. That's the second one time I've come up against a knife. Fortunately, it didn't come near me, but um, all I'm saying is how strange that is. You get on a train expecting just a journey, and I nearly ended up in a knife fight. But that's because you have to stick up. You young people, if you see an old person in trouble, you've got to help them. You've got to help people that are in trouble, otherwise what's the point of getting up in the morning? Next question. When you, you talk about, you talk about that you worked on the book, obviously reading each chapter, um, as you came in, so it was about reading the experiences for yeah. you. Which is the favourite most, or which is the chapter that's out the most? Oh gosh, well, well, again, let me be slightly serious. Um, I was married, I've only been married twice, I was married to a lady named Diana for 21 years. And I made her pregnant back in the 60s when you made a woman pregnant, you had to get married. And those marriages never worked. They just never worked. And I had a son and a daughter, Jason Lee Woods, and a daughter named Samantha Lee Woods. My son is now 52. My daughter is, I don't know, about 55, I think. And from the moment my son was born, he was trouble. Um, we now know he was dyslexic, like I was, the figures. But he ended up being a lying, thieving, awful man who ended up on heroin and like you do, and he moved to Hong Kong, and that's where he was a heroin addict. And he got involved with the, 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 the gangs over there, which ended up getting him in business. But I hated my son. My mum hated my son. My daughter hated my son. Everybody hated my son. But I hated him the most. And then, 15 years ago, when I was in Los Angeles, just before I had to leave, I had a phone call from my son, and I remember picking up the phone and said, hello, Jason, hello, Dad, it's Jason. And I remember my whole body thinking, oh God, what do you want now? And I said, what do you want? You've already ruined my life, you know, what do you want? He said, I want you back in my life. I want you to love me again. Well, <laughs> so I flew out to New Zealand where he is, and I now am in love with him again. And um, it, it, it was a big moment. After 30 years of hate, what one doesn't understand is how intense the love is. There. And so, I have to thank God for loving my son again. And, um, and then I realized that my father, bless his little heart, you've got to read the book, not because I want you to buy it, you're either going to buy it or you're not, and we're not making, you don't make that much money. If you sell a thousand copies, I'll make five grand. Big deal. The biggest thing I think was that my father hated me so much and beat me so often that you end up thinking that this is what all of life is, and that's what it is. It is what it is. Well, I was drunk one night on the ship, so I'm not a drinker, I've never been a drinker, I, I, I don't like what it does to you, but I got drunk on the ship, drink three times. And I was going to commit suicide, I was going to jump off the ship. Uh, three people had done it before, and it seemed to me like a good idea. I was lost, I was dead, I was dying by the day. I'd lost everyone, my wife, my son, everybody. And I thought, well look, I'd always wanted to die in a fight. Now that headline I wouldn't buy, because it wouldn't have been suicide, it would have been John Levine fell overboard trying to save someone's life by the line. <laughs> and he died a hero. I'd have liked that. But anyway, as just about as I was about to fall off, you don't know it when you're drunk, you don't know when your brain takes over. I was almost losing my balance. And the truth is, I was looking at the way the ship broke waves, because the reason I wanted to be at sea is because my father was a war hero on the Russian convoy, and John Pertwee was on the HMS, I forgot, Hood, the HMS Hood, and he was one of only three sailors that wasn't on it when it was sunk by the Bismarck. For all of you young people that don't have a clue about the Second World War, people my age are always going to talk about it because it was that war that saved your lives. And it was the Battle of Britain pilots and my father that made it possible for all of you to sit here today. And my dad and his mates, 300 of his best mates killed in two days. 14 ships out of 40 were sunk. Some of them went down in three minutes. 400 men at a time. So no wonder I ended up sad. My father never stopped crying at the loss of his friends. And do we have, do we have a sound system in here? You know, the truth is, I, my, I found the sound, um, the BBC did a sound bite from the PQ-17 that my father was on. And I've got, on record, my father's ship being attacked. 
I wanted to play it here. It would, it would drive you insane. In fact, I wish I brought, I meant to bring it with me. Damn it. Oh, what a shame. I wanted you to hear what my father, and my father was on the pom-poms. My father got the DSM and the DSO from George V for shooting down seven Stukas in five days. It's all in his book, uh, all in his diary. So yeah, so my dad ended up a war hero. And I didn't feel as though I was going to amount to anything. And it's ironic, isn't it, that I ended up playing a, kind of a hero, if you like, um, a soldier on television, making out I'm a hero. Uh, but I've done a lot of heroic things since then, which I can't talk about, uh, because I wanted to be stronger, and I wanted to be braver, and I wanted to get rid of this hate for my father. And the name of the last chapter of my book, which is my favorite chapter, I have to admit I love my own words. So I don't mind admitting that when you're old, you can admit it. I have turned out to be quite a beautiful little wordsmith. My words will make you cry. I think my jokes will make you laugh. But the main thing of it is, is just sharing it. Now that I've shared it, I'm glad it's off my shoulders. And just my last word on this is that um, the name of the chapter that I love the most is Forgiveness of Two Fathers. So I've forgiven my father. My son has forgiven me. And the very end, the very last chapter of my book is the bit that made me cry the most when well, I can't go into the story's too long, but when my son and my two grandchildren left their visit in Salisbury eight months ago, I felt that my father had spoken to me from heaven because he'd seen that the hate that he had generated in me and that I had hated my son, but my son doesn't hate his son and he no longer hates me. So really and truly, this book is about forgiving my father and my son forgiving me for being such a bastard father. How embarrassed am I that I was such a bad father? You know, should have known better. Should have learned from people that went before, but we don't, do we? We carry on blundering through. And now everyone I know is dead and dying, and it's just hard. And I am finding it. Good. And the book. Yeah, it makes you cry. It's, 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 it's bleeding, sad, I have to say. But then it's quite pretty as well. But you cry about his mother. Well, yeah, and, of course, and I, I do want to thank my wife. I mean, bless her heart. You know, uh, 15 of the 20 years were wonderful. And, you know, I used to have a radio show back in the day. And my closing, I, lo I love quotes. I love quotes. I'm also, I'm bloody exhausted here. I am writing a screenplay, as I've told some of you. I've been writing it for five years. And one of Hollywood's top movie stars wants it. And I'm going to be very rich if I get it, if I sell it. At the moment, Sheldon knows, I'm living on a pension. Just to let you know how, re how real life is. I'm living on 508 quid a month pension. And I'm not doing very well. Trouble is, I always look as I'm doing well, because I've always loved dressing. But yeah, so anyway, life has been a bit tough, but you know, by running, and uh, you know I've learned to sing, and I have to be honest with you, I can't tell you how I thank God for my voice. I have ended up with a lovely voice, and I can say that because it's taken me three years to learn. I play, I, I sing Sinatra, and I've just learned one of the most beautiful songs I've ever heard in my life. I want you to put your hands up, especially if you're a lady, if you agree, have you seen The Greatest Showman? And have you heard that Never Enough? Isn't that a stunning song? Well, guess what? I nailed it, and I'm performing it next week. Isn't it the most, I can't listen to that song without breaking down. And do you know what I think it is? When you live in America, you realize that obesity is a crisis, and we're getting here too. We are getting so fat here, and it's all crappy. But in America, the greed for money and the obesity and the need for fame is overwhelming. And I put up with it for 20 years and I couldn't bear it anymore. In one sense, I'm always glad my wife divorced me because it meant I came back to my country. I was born in Salisbury, five minutes to midnight, Christmas Eve, 1941. And now I'm back to the end of my life. I can't tell you how happy I am to be in Salisbury. I adore my own life. Of course, Salisbury is my So, all in all,
Only ladies will understand that, and people with sonic screwdrivers. Um, I was born breech, jaundice, and dead. Came out of my mother's feet first. I turned round on my mother's throat canal, and only you ladies will understand what that's like. So instead of coming out feet first, head first, I came out feet first. So my whole life was going to be a problem because I was dead from it. So what happened is when I left Salisbury and went to London, I, I, I had to do something because my father's hate just broke through me away. I got a job as a walk-on. Um, I remember that all the agencies I had said, so John, have you ever been a cyberman? And I remember thinking, well, what a silly bloody question that is. <laughs> Back in 1962, I said, no, I haven't been a cyberman. Anyway, that's how I was started. And then I became a yeti, as you know. And then one day, Douglas Campion came up. And this is where I like, this is the part of myself I like. I love my energy. In fact, do you have my computer? Yeah, I do have your computer. Let me, Not if you want me, if you have, if you'd like me to sum everything up in, in a paragraph, it's a quote before my little photographs, and it is this. this. This is how I see myself, and this is how I would advise everyone that wants to be creative. This is the path I believe you should take. Now, having said that, this is only my opinion. Every one of you has your own. When a tough, now this is about life, and you know, I be, I'm a producer now, I don't act anymore, and I love producing more than I ever enjoyed acting. <coughs> so this is about really life in general. When a tough, challenging job is to be done, I look for a person who possesses an enthusiasm and an optimism for life, who makes a zestful, confident attack on his daily problems, one who shows courage and imagination, who pins down his buoyant spirit with careful planning and hard work, but says, this may be tough, but it can be lived. And that's the kind of way I look at life. And I ended up <coughs> being brave because I was sick of being a coward. That's why I became a long distance runner. That's why I started standing up and trying to get in a few fights to be a bit more brave because I was sick of being a coward. And in my book, <coughs> you will see that when the Teddy Boys, the Teddy Boys invaded Salisbury, I don't know when it was, 19, you, in about 1952, and a lot of you won't even remember Teddy Boys. They had great big hair, they had bicycle chains, which would take your arm off. They had razor blades, which would take your cheek off. And they just went around cutting everybody up, button them, what they used to call the Glasgow Kiss. And they used to go around terrorizing towns. Anybody here remember the Teddy Boys? You must shout, yeah. Big creep, what they used to call brothel creepers, big thick. So, well, one day, uh, a four of them threatened to beat me and my mate. We were only like kids, and five years old. And my dad being an ex soldier, and uh, what these Teddy Boys didn't realize when they challenged my father and his wartime buddies to a fight, to end all fights in Salisbury Marketplace. What these teddy boys haven't realized is going around beating innocent kids up that haven't got an ounce of courage in them is not actually uh, fighting, it's cowardice. It's like hitmen going up behind someone and blowing their brains out. That's not being clever. That's not that easy. Anyway, um, the long story short, <laughs> I've forgotten what I'm about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, one of them had threatened my, my, one of my father's mates, so my dad and his soldier mates went down and the biggest battle that Salisbury's ever seen and the one thing that these teddy boys with their chains and razor blades had forgotten is that my father and his friends had been taught to kill and maim with one hand. They wiped the floor with the teddy boys. They broke every bone in their body and they disappeared. Now I had asked my father if I could come down and fight my first battle. Well obviously I wouldn't have lasted five seconds. It made me feel a little brave. Anyway, my dad saw a little bit more in me and then started to become brave. And then Douglas Campbell saw me trying to be brave, and he just came up and said, if you can speak the words, the chap that's playing Sergeant Benton has been sacked. I can't remember, there are two different stories out there. One is that he was late, and I don't know what the other one is, but he said, if you could speak the dialogue, you'd get the part. Well, I'd never had any training, theater, voice lessons, or anything. I was just a men's whistle. So anyway, he gave me a script, like you do. He had to go away and make a few phone calls, and I thought that all actors, which is why the guilt of me not being a good actor, like Pat Gable and so many other big actors, because you haven't been trained, you don't think you can act. Or maybe I was a better actor because I wasn't trained. Who knows? We will never know that. But anyway, that's how it all started, is judging the soul by courage. And that's why I speak about it, because I'm just glad I became courageous, you know? It's faith as well. It is, it is faith as well, yes. Faith plays a massive part, and that is where it takes you. Yeah, like goodness me. Yes. Um, you know, I mean, for me, I, I mean, I grew up. I, I was. Uh, I, I started watching Doctor Who at the end of John's era. Right. Um, and as I've, as I've grown up and looked back on Doctor Who, the unit era for me is one of the crowning definitive eras of yeah. the show. Yeah. You know, there's all of you there. They all, the ensemble cast. It doesn't make that era quite so special. 
Well, first of all, I think asking someone who was in it, I, I don't know how to answer it other than when Patran was leaving, you must know the viewing figures were going down. They were plummeting. Not because of that. Maybe, I, I, we don't know what it was. Maybe it was black and white TVs, we don't know. And I remember being in the TA hall rehearsing the last of Pat Tran's stories. And the producer, who maybe was Clarinet, came and said, We've got the new doctor outside. Would you like to meet him? And all I know is, as little Johnny Woods from Salisbury, having been scared of everything, by then I'd become a little better. Pat Tran had liked me. Fraser Heisen and I got on like a house on fire. We both have the same sense of humor. I find Fraser very entertaining. Uh, we both go on a little bit too long, but then we get over one. Anyway, um, when he said, we're going to bring the doc new doctor, and it was John Pertwee. Well, I didn't know what to say. I mean, he was my mum and dad's favorite comedian. I'd heard him in all the radio shows, and I think Wilson Governor, I think, I don't know whether that was before or after. Anyway, so it was this bloke, and I got on with him from the minute I met. John and I just clicked. At that time, he was having a bit of trouble with his son, Sean, like all fathers do with all sons, and I was obviously having trouble with mine. So anyway, we got on like a house on fire, and within one day, the only thing John had, which I'm glad he had, he was um, what they call an opportun opportunistic man. If he saw something, he'd go and get it. Like, for example, Stratford John, the big movie star, had had his house painted uh, by Dulux, all because he did a commercial for nothing. And he got his house painted for like 20 grand's <laughs> worth. And John, well, that's like, so John, went, he went to Dulux and said, oh, you can paint my house. So he was a bit of an opportunist uh, man. And he loved money a bit too much, which he admitted at the end. He was a bit money obsessed. But that was all. Uh, apart from that, John was the most gracious and wonderful man. So you imagine, as a new young actor, I've suddenly got John Pertwee saying to me, would you drive my car? I'm doing a cabaret on Saturday night. Would you drive me up to Nottingham? And I, I'm like, yes. <laughs> and I was married at the time. And um, so yeah, I spent more time with John, really, I suppose, than, than, than his wife, because we were together all the time. And then, of course, Katie joined. Um, and this was Slave Mill. She was after. Um, uh, Caroline John was sensationally superb as an actress, but she just didn't work. She was too clever a, a character to be with a doctor who was clever. But when Katie took over, her semi-blindness and her absolute blundering about was just the key to everything we needed. Because it made, although Richard Franklin was meant to be the love interest, funny enough, I've just done a gig with Katie, where because Katie's always hugging and kissing me, because we've been friends for 55 years. I've never been romantically linked with Katie because I, I was already married and I wouldn't do that anyway. But uh, the other day she's always hugging and kissing me um, on the cheek and everything. And as I walked through the crowd, I heard someone say, do you know what? I knew there was something between Katie and Mike. Because <laughs> <laughs> everybody always said, why didn't Ben get a woman? You know, all I ever got was the bloody Dalek. You know? <laughs> but um, yeah, you could feel straight away uh, that there was a comradeship there. Um, uh, mainly in the studio, if I were to be totally frank with you, the absolute crux of the show was Katie, myself, and John. Nick Courtney, bless his heart, didn't have much of a sense of humor, and everyone knows Nick enjoyed his drink, so Nick was very, very ready with us. But on screen, his brilliant brigadier, and my almost innocent Benton, given that I didn't know how to, like sometimes I got a scene and I remember thinking, well, how do you act this? Well, the truth is, you just speak the bloody words and your body does the rest. And of course, you put a uniform on a man like me. I mean, I did look at these books. You know, I thought it was like, and you know we weren't allowed to throw, we were not allowed to hit a punch because it was a children's program. All our punches had to be held. So all Ben never did was threaten, you brought all bloody war, and all I ever wanted to do. And of course I did all my own stunts, which you know I paid heavily for. Nearly broke my back in the demons. I, I injured myself a lot, but then that's the way it should be. You can't expect to do a fight with the James Bond stunt man and do all that fight night and come out. You know, but you get real. You like, you know, you get hurt in life. You know. What's it been like going back and watching over those? You've just done a, a series. Oh my God! Yeah. A series of. I can't believe they can see our legs and our socks up and everything. Brilliant. Yeah. But you've just retrospectively gone back and watched the three. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, what's that? that well, I mean, like again, you know, I could. Well, of course, Katie and I have always gone on, but I mean, I noticed we were nudging each other. You were. There's so many things you want to say that you sort of think you didn't want to say. But I, I, I thought it look. It's been 55 years, and the fact that Doctor Who is still as big now as it was then, the fact that you still love we characters, and I feel that love, believe me, just